Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Ken Moore, and this is Local Matters. Well, today I have with me Casey Lee. You may have seen her name and picture in the newspaper because she's the one that organized the Black Lives Matter Matters protest in McMinnville. And so I found out who she was, gave her a call and said, come, please be on my show. I know people will want to hear uh, about from you and about you and what you're up to. Casey, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Well, maybe you could just give us a little introduction. Tell us a little about yourself. Well, I'm Casey, and I am going to be in the class of 21, so 21, so I'm graduating this summer. I've grown up here my entire life. I've gone to school here as well. My dad owns the Dairy Queen on the way to Sheridan and Lincoln City, so. Oh, on the way to Sheridan, like, so between here and Sheridan, between yeah. and Sheridan, that one on the, on the left as you're headed, headed west. Yeah. Wow, and how long has he owned that? I think around... 18, 19 years, I would say. I'm not exactly sure, but around there. Well, I haven't been there lately because, you know, I'm, is, it, is, it, is it open? You're open for business? The drive through is open, but the lobby has yet to open up yet. And that's been almost, and then not quite, I guess, or I, is it, what's he thinking? Do you, you guys talk about that on when the lobby might open? Um, not really. I just know that like initially when the pandemic started, he was really nervous about only the drive through being open, but it hasn't been too bad, which is good. good. All right. Well, let's uh, keep that in mind when we're hungry going down, going down to Sheridan. All right. Well, thank you for that. Anything else you want to tell us about? Maybe, um, maybe you can start with how you came to organizing this protest. Maybe back up a ways and when did um, things start going off in your head that, hey, there's something that the uh, community needs to do something about? Yeah, so um, I think it was on a Saturday or a Friday, my good friend, Ceci Flores, texted me at like 10 a.m. in the morning. and was like, do you want to come stand on like the corner next in front of the police station and protest with me? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. And I think from seeing the sheer amount of negative responses that like five high schoolers got kind of empowered us to start a bigger protest and actually invite more people to come. And so it started with five people and it kind of like snowballed into the huge thing. That now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The negative reaction. Yeah, <laughs> because it was just, we knew that like people weren't going to be happy, but we realized that there were just so many people that flipped us off. Some people rolled down their windows and like cussed at us too. And just like the way that people reacted made us, come face to face with how much racism actually does exist, even in a small town like McMinnville. What did so. your sign say that got these reactions? My said that, I think it was silence is complicit and then it had like different forms of action and then Ceci said, and police brutality. And then my friend Kaya's had justice for George Floyd. And then we had one more sign, but I forgot what it said exactly. Those don't sound uh, <laughs> swear worthy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Whoa, so I bet you were shocked. Yeah, I mean, we kind of expected it, but just like how many people took it upon themselves to react was very surprising. Okay, well, again, I'm still surprised that it was the negative reaction that's going <laughs> forward. You want more of that, huh? So what happened then? So then we started a group chat, all five of us, and then we started talking and picked a day. It was Monday. It was very fast turnaround time. And then we decided to create graphics. I created the little like black post to go on Facebook and Instagram and we just started like reposting it. And we honestly expected maybe around like 50 people to come. So it's very surprising and it all happened very suddenly as well. So your, your five um, high school friends were on what day of the week? I think it was Friday or Saturday. I'm going to say Friday just to be safe. And then the protest happened on what day? Monday. Just a couple days later. Yeah. And how would you gauge the um, the turnout, the success? What, what were you wondering how many would come and then what happened? We were thinking like minimum, maybe around 50 and maximum, maybe 150. We weren't really expecting more people to actually show up, but then a lot of people did end up coming, which is very exciting and we're very happy about it. So I, um, I got an email from uh, Gloria Goodrum, the uh, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. 
<laughs> and she sent out your letter that you sent to the chamber. Mm -hmm. um, I think your the, the, the letter was explaining what you were doing. Yeah. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And the fact that they sent that out without comment, just like here, you, you should know, you should know this. I was um, delighted by that. And, um, and then how the community turned out. Now, you, did you have some interaction with the police? Um, very briefly before I gave them a phone call and asked them kind of what their presence was going to be like at the protest, because I felt like that was very important in regards to how we thought the protest was gonna end up unfolding. But besides that, no, not really. Okay, and then were there police pre was there police presence there? Yeah, it was very small, but it existed. And we communicated with them beforehand about like, if something were to happen, what would, how would the police react? And just like conversations like that. So I bet they appreciated that heads up so they could kind of have some people maybe paying attention. Mm -hmm. Did, did um, the same kind of reaction happen? What happened? Um, I feel like in comparison to like protests in larger cities, the reaction and also on the receiving end, it was very different in that because we don't have like a huge black community in McVinville specifically and also looking at maybe some of the differences between like a smaller de police department like McVinville PD versus larger police departments like the Portland Police Department, but yeah. And did you get similar reactions from passersby? Um, not entirely sure. I wasn't able to go to like the big protest because my dad was worried that, you know, something would happen, which is like totally okay. But I feel like generally speaking, I hope so because the whole point of the protest itself was to get people talking because I feel like that's a huge problem in McVinville is where we think we're like immune to all the issues that happen nationally, which is totally not true. And so we really just wanted to get people talking and I feel like as long as people had conversations, and as long as people were inspired to act outside of the protest, then I would say so, yeah. Mm. And there was another protest that followed, wasn't there? Uh, different organi organized by different people? I believe so. I didn't know about it until later on, but yeah, I think so. All right, well, you certainly led the way. It's so interesting that five kids with signs on a corner <laughs> really stirred up some emotions there. Now, what have you seen since that time? Have you seen a change in the way this conversation is going? I would say more people are talking, which is obviously, of course, good. But I think at the same time, I really want to see more action happen. Like I went to the uh, city council meeting that regarded the budgeting. And I feel like some of the sentiments that were shared were a little bit disheartening. And I feel like the same thing goes with how people that I go to school with have also talked about Black Lives Matter. So it's very much a mixed bag because I feel like some people actually really took it in and took it upon themselves to act more. But I feel like for others, it could have gone the other way. So, Well, I did watch the uh, recording of the city council meeting. I think it was June 9th. And uh, they proclaimed their support of Black Lives Matter, the city council in entirety. Yeah. Um, so uh, to me, that's 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 something. That's that's big. That's a change. It, it seems um, just months ago, the Black Lives Matter was people didn't want to touch that or go there. It was too radical, yeah. and now it seems like that has just been a sea change. It, have you seen that? I would hope so. It's just coming from like my perspective, where I get this to see a bunch of like corporations and different administrations speak out on their position on Black Lives Matter, I feel like I'll believe it when I see something happen is kind of how I like to roll with it. Cause I know like a lot of different companies have said we support Black Lives Matter and then have given these statements on how they're going to actually support the cause, but it normally isn't followed up with action. And even if it is, it's very small acts of action when they have the capabilities to do more, if that makes sense. Well, um, what do you want to see happen? I think there are a multitude of things that can happen. I think starting with the school district, we can talk about 
incorporating classes at all levels of education, so the grade schools, the middle schools, and the high school that actually talk about Black and African American history or talk about white privilege, and we can talk about incorporating more Black and Latinx and Indigenous peoples into forms of administration because our administration is predominantly made up of white folks. Or we can talk about changing like the pedagogy of teachers and how they actually teach about Black history and African American history, specifically, for example, in AP US history, which is one of the only classes that I've taken in all of my years of school that actually talk about slavery. And we can talk about maybe the police department, of course, is a very hot topic, but talking about like, for example, aid to abolition or in defunding the police and actually taking progressive steps away from the system that is inherently founded on racism against, you know, Black Americans and enslaved people during, like, before the Civil War, of course. So I think there are a lot of different things that you can talk about, but in my mind, the two biggest ones are with reform within the police department that lead to abolishing the police and then also just reform within our school district itself. So have you had conversations with um, administrators uh, about having curriculum change? I'm actually in the midst of drafting a petition. I didn't want to go too fast on like putting it out there because I wanted to talk to more people because obviously like I can't speak for all black students in our community or just black students in general. So I wanted to kind of get a better gauge and have more contributors with the petition itself. But I think it's a conversation that definitely needs to happen in light of everything that's happening across the nation. But also, I feel like it's a very, it's a conversation that should have happened in the past. I agree with that. Here I am at um, whatever age I am, and uh, <laughs> uh, Juneteenth was new to me. Um, yeah. So I feel um, chagrined that I ha am so, and remain um, so uninformed. Mm -hmm. And um, that has been, well, my book list has changed. And uh, I can say that it really has affected me in, in my, my um, understanding of the problem. So you said something I wanna back up to, you said abolishing the police, would you talk about that? Yeah, so there are a lot of different I guess, plans for reform or proposals for reform that exist across the nation today. And just like the big issue that hits home with me is it's less about reform of individual departments, but it's more about reform of this whole idea of policing itself that exists in America today. So I think if you look back to the history of police, I think it just speaks for itself is that police were created to find enslaved people that had escaped and bring them back to their, I guess, like slave masters, that's what they called them in the past. And that in and of itself created this foundation for the police to be built against Black Americans and also Latinx and Indigenous folks as well. And I just think that sheer idea speaks to the fact that we need to change and we need to stop relying on this institution that was built against the com communities of color. Um, in the first place. And I feel like reform is good, but the reform doesn't matter until it actually leads to progressive change of the institution itself. Now, progressive change of the institution is different from abolishing it. What, what, what can you talk about those two, two um, choices? Yeah. So I think if, for example, with the, I believe it's eight can't wait, like those types of reforms is obviously like a progressive step in the right direction, but a huge issue with them is that it doesn't solve the root issue, which is the institution itself. When we talk about, for example, like police reforms and qualified immunity, and also kind of incorporating, for example, mental health specialists to be the one to actually answer these calls. Because I was reading these statistics about who calls the police, and I feel like it was very eye-opening in that, for example, with people who are homeless, they don't like calling the police because they're afraid that they might get punished. And also um, survivors of domestic abuse are in the same boat where they are afraid to call the police. And I feel like incorporating these different sectors of you know, social help would be imperative to actually reform the police in a way that we don't rely on them in the way that we do now, if that makes sense. So yeah, we do rely on the police in, in a lot of different ways. Um, one of those ways is when you need help. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I'm gonna ask, who are you gonna call if there's no police department? Help me envision that, how does that work? So I think abolishing the police in itself is very 
vague and kind of a very new idea to a lot of people, but it doesn't necessarily mean getting rid of law enforcement itself, but it's getting rid of the form of law enforcement that we have today. Because crime is very predictable and you know what types of crime is going to happen, for example, domestic abuse or robberies and, you know, drug abuses and stuff like that. And so having different sectors that are specialized specifically for those areas would be a form of getting rid of the police and abolishing the police because right now the police wasn't created to solve all of our societal woes. Like I said in the past, they were specifically for helping these slave owners in the South specifically. So I think getting rid of this whole idea that we have today and incorporating these new forms of law enforcement that are specialized for specific types of crime would be a world of where we don't have police or where we do abolish the police. You know, when you were talking about having more um, maybe specialized uh, departments for these different situations that you named, I thought about my compassion for police officers in what they're expected to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it seems to be impossible that they're asked to do so many different things and many times dangerous things and then many times very complicated things and they get it right. And it's not every, anything I've ever been attracted to. I don't think that I would be someone that is well equipped to be in that position. Um, so I see a lot of strain on individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it seems to be um, a very difficult thing to sustain from, that, yeah. from a human compassionate um, aspect for the, for the officers themselves. Um, have you ever felt those kinds of feelings? Yeah, for sure. And I feel like there's a very fine line between, you know, this whole idea of all cops are bad, because I know that, like, for example, the police that work at the school district and just, like, police that I've had interactions with, they're all great people in and of themselves. Um, but the issue at hand, I feel like, is the problem with the institution that enables instances like George Floyd to continue to happen as they've happened in the past. And I feel like the narrative that I feel like is the most important to focus on is less about these individuals and more about the institution itself, because this institution is actively supporting the oppression of black Americans today. Actively support. Now here in McMinnville, this, I want, let's, let's talk local matters. Mm -hmm. What, um, what kind of things would you like to see happen? We talked about mm -hmm. education, but maybe concerning our police or our community from the, both the police side and from the community side, maybe the city council has something that, that you want to have them do. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the first step to kind of seeing the change, or maybe I'm speaking too much for everyone, but seeing steps to abolishing the police would be defunding the police because the police still take up a huge amount of the McMinnville budget and reinvesting that money into communities of color. For example, our KOB program, which has shrunk dramatically in the past few years that uniquely benefit students that have parents who work. And a lot of the time those students are Latinx students or students of color. So I think taking that money and putting it back into these specific communities and also trying to fix our homelessness issue um, would be really important. Um, and I feel like maybe I'm just because I'm a student, I'm very focused on like the McMinnville School District, but seeing like curriculum change and pedagogy change and seeing a greater focus on these students of color specifically, that isn't tokenizing in a way, if that makes sense, but yeah. Um, what do you mean, I, what didn't follow you on tokenizing? Mm -hmm. So I feel like a lot of the time, and this is just like natural to trying to be more diverse, a lot of the time when companies or schools try to do this, it happens in a way that's very tokenizing where they will hire, like for example, an African-American teacher, black teacher, but in a way where it's like putting a band-aid on the issue itself. And there, it's just, it makes it so that it feels like that black teacher is only hired because they are black rather than for the purpose of actually trying to be diverse and inclusive. Now, have you seen, thank you, have you seen issues of, or examples or incidents of racism here in McMinnville that maybe you would like to point out as an example of some of the problems that we have? I think the biggest one for me is just racism among our student body that often is 
very much swept under the rug and it's very annoyingly swept under the rug. Um, so that's like the first example that pops into my head because there is a lot of racism that exists in the student body and in our school system, but that no one chooses to talk about. And I feel like not talking about it contributes to the issue. Obviously silence is complicit. Um, so that's the first example that would pop into my head, but also it's just like the programs that are built to benefit communities of color are often the ones that are the most underfunded and get the least amount of resources, either from McVin Falls community itself or smaller institutions that just exist within the community as well. No, Casey, I'd like to just back up to what you said about um, racism in, in school. Mm -hmm. um, I admit I haven't really thought about that. And yeah. that's hard to hear. And that is, you know, very close to home. I'm sure that's why that's the first thing that pops into your mind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, wow. How is, what, what is that like? Can you describe what, the, what forms that racism takes in, in, at McMinnville High School? I feel like a lot of it comes from this really weird culture that we all been complacent to like I know when I was a freshman sophomore like really not until this year did I actually call people out for being racist but a lot of like passing comments or jokes and over the past few months I've actually tried to like call people out when they're being racist and I feel like with this platform of social media people are able to show what they really believe in and just like through the conversations I've had, it's become very clear that there are a lot of people that are my age who've taken the same classes as me, who just refuse to believe that the issue that we're talking about even exists. Like multiple people have told me that they don't believe that the racism and like the systemic oppression that we talk about is an actual issue. And which is very surprising to me because I feel like at the minimum, being able to acknowledge the issue is something that everyone should be able to do. But the fact that many students that I've talked to don't actually realize the problem is very concerning. I, I can certainly imagine. Um, so let's just stay in the high school um, venue for a minute and talk about maybe some sort of way forward. What do you see to do something about this? Um, I said education before. I'm kind of at thinking maybe peer to peer I feel like period, yeah, I feel like for me, the biggest thing, of course, is like I said earlier, is curriculum change. I feel like peer to peer, I'm not entirely sure, only because our school body, if you look at it, just demographically is so concentrated with white students, um, which is just because of like the demographic of where we are in McMinnville. But I feel like having these conversations that are actually productive, specifically with adults and with a diverse group of students is very imperative and kind of erasing this narrative that we have today. But I feel like additionally, one of the biggest things that this McMinnville School District can do is incorporating these classes and changing the way that we talk about race, specifically in social studies classes, language arts classes and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I, it sounds like there's some lines drawn here and um, that there seems to be um, some intractability perhaps in your mind. It's just very difficult to operate in, in the kind of environment you're talking about as far as um, getting other people to kind of see or to understand the issues. And yeah, yeah. go ahead. And I feel like just at the day, it's like I'm hitting this wall and I feel like a lot of people agree with this. It's just this wall of like, I can't talk someone into caring about other people. Cause at the end of the day, that, that's what it comes down to is like, do you care? about black lives do you care about even with the mask thing there's a lot of like outcry within our student body about wearing masks it's like do you care about other people enough to actually change the actions that you're doing right now well well uh it sounds like it's a, a, a microcosm of the larger world it's uh it doesn't um uh it doesn't have easy solutions yeah um, I think that your, your action of getting people's awareness around it and having people come out to say who they are is commendable. Um, do you have plans for um, more organizing? Um, what, what do you see going forward for you? Um, for organizing, like protests itself, not really. 
um, I've been working with a couple of friends on petitions and stuff like that, some directed towards the school district and others kind of directed towards the McMinnville community as a whole. But besides that, I've been spending a lot of my time just like learning because I feel like that's a huge thing that everyone should do on an individual basis is just learning more about the movement and what we can do um, to be good, productive allies that actually contribute beneficially to the movement itself. Well, I, I wish you the best. I commend you for your compassion, your energy. And I think um, we're hungry for leaders and um, I'm proud to have you on the show and let people get to know you and uh, what you're up to. And uh, let's keep in touch. I'm wishing you all the best. And uh, Casey Lee, thank you for so much for being on Local Matters today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh,